When you began your career, the Cold War was still underway, and the U.S. had previously experienced the Red Scare and McCarthyism. And then, Dr. Kissinger makes a secret trip to China in July of 1971. Can you share your experience working on China during this time period and witnessing the shift in policy and approach to China? Well, one had to tiptoe around the idea of any kind of normal relationship with what was then called Red China. Um, and in fact, when we were not supposed to use the word Peking to refer to Beijing, uh, but to say Beiping, which was the nationalist Chinese uh, name for the capital of what they called the bogus regime on the mainland. Um, and this was a matter of political correctness, a legacy of McCarthy and Dulles and uh, U.S. Uh, debates over, quote, who lost China, unquote, as though it had been ours to lose. In any event, um, I began uh, uh, working on China in a period when uh, we were totally estranged. Um, but I was elated when uh, President Nixon, who had argued in a foreign affairs article that we needed to reach out to China, appointed Henry Kissinger as his national security advisor. Kissinger was the author of a book called A World Restored, which was about dealing with the aftermath of the Re French Revolution and the Napoleonic Wars and reincorporating France into a stable European state system. I thought there were enormous parallels to be seen with what we would have to do with China. Um, and so uh, I uh, expected when Nixon took office, a fairly rapid evolution in our China policy. Now, that didn't happen. Uh, Nixon was politically cautious. Um, and while he began to send signals to the Chinese, they were mostly not public. Uh, so there was a period when I began to doubt that I had read the situation right. You mentioned Nixon's um, article about China. Uh, President Nixon had been seen as a staunch anti-communist, and yet he ended up being the president to go to China, and he wrote this article and instituted these changes. What do you think caused this shift? Nixon was, uh, of course, as you say, he had uh, been quite opportunist, opportunistically anti-communist from the beginning of his political career. Uh, but he was also a statesman. Uh, he had traveled extensively around the world. He understood foreign policy, uh, geopolitics very well. Uh, and uh, he saw the merits of keeping China as an active participant in the balance with the Soviet Union. In fact, shortly after he was elected, he startled his cabinet uh, when he came in and said, uh, we can't allow the Soviet Union uh, to humiliate or conquer China, uh, which was a statement that the rest of the cabinet found baffling. But he was looking at the Sino-Soviet uh, skirmishes on the border, both in Keilongjiang province in China, and that's the Soviet maritime provinces, and in Central Asia in Xinjiang. Uh, and he saw the possibility that the Soviets might attempt to resubjugate China, reincorporate it into their sphere of influence. And that made him think, this is something we need to prevent. And I think that was the impetus for his decision to make such an effort to break through decades of isolation in the two countries and reach out. Uh, to Beijing by sending Kissinger uh, there. I was aware of the intention to send an emissary before it happened because I was tapped to head the, to be the, tramp, the interpreter at the Warsaw talks, which were ambassadorial level talks mm -hmm. in the Polish capital that had been going on for quite a while. Uh, <clears throat> and in preparation, I went up to the embassy in Taipei, which was where it was at the time and read the record of the Warsaw Talks. And the last Warsaw Talks talk had, uh, had approached the Chinese with such a proposal. And it had also offered um, the basic formula that we used later 
to finesse the Taiwan question. So I was expecting a special emissary. And when I was called back to Washington suddenly to work on all sorts of briefing papers, which I wasn't, I was never told what they were about, um, I knew what they were about, but I didn't know who would be the special emissary. And I was a bit surprised when it turned out to be Henry Kissinger. So after Kissinger's trip, there was then, of course, the lead up to President Nixon's own visit. Um, can you talk about that process, your role, the attitudes that you were seeing, and the hopes for the visit? Well, this opening had been structured very strangely in order to preserve confidentiality. Nixon basically didn't trust the State Department. Uh, he was using uh, Kissinger and the then rather small National Security Council staff mm -hmm. um, as sort of the foreign ministry for great power relations and leaving the rest of the State Department. Um, William Rogers, the Secretary of State, was an old friend of Nixon's, but not someone whose foreign policy knowledge, expertise, or reasoning he particularly respected. So um, he ran everything out of the White House. You were with the State Department at the time. Indeed, though I, I will explain. Um, uh, there is a normal mechanism for communication between the State Department and the White House, mm -hmm. which goes through the Secretariat, which is the Secretary of State's office. Um, the communications for this bypassed that. So basically, I wrote papers which were then bootlegged uh, to an unknown person, namely Kissinger, uh, by the head of the China desk. Um, and the NSC staff, which at that time on China consisted of Ambassador John Holdridge mm -hmm. and uh, Dick Solomon, both of them unfortunately now deceased, would take those papers and um, lightly edit them perhaps, or, but basically retype them so they looked like they were their own work. Oh, wow. Uh, uh, this later led to the invention of something called the State Department briefing paper stationery, which was intended to thwart that um, effort to take credit for things that um, the State Department or Foreign Service people at the State Department had actually written. And so this is a process that was uh, under the table, largely. Um, in the preparation for the Nixon visit, I was essentially locked in the operations center, mm -hmm. in a special little group, uh, for almost two months. Um, I'm told I wrote almost half of the briefing papers. Oh, wow. President. The last minute I was asked to write a briefing book for Pat Nixon um, about other things, uh, Chinese culture, arts, and sciences, and uh, that sort of thing. And I did so relying heavily, I must say, on a wonderful uh, guide to China that the Swiss publisher Nagels had put out. Um, so I plagiarized freely from that. Um, but uh, anyway, uh, I was very heavily involved in the preparation. I was getting probably three hours of sleep a night and the rest of the time writing and um, thinking and trying to, uh, trying to provide the basis for a knowledgeable dialogue with people that very few Americans then knew. The Kissinger trip had been made public by this point. So there must have been some discussion or some sentiment that you that you were hearing about, you know, reopening with China. Well, I think there was um, a mixed, there were mixed feelings. Um, in effect, the left in the United States had long objected to the almost to the farcical notion that the government of China was located in Taiwan. Um, Taipei was represented in the Security Council until 1971, after the, Nixon, after the Kissinger trip. Uh, and their arguments had been that uh, we needed to recognize the reality of the Chinese revolution. Um, there was a bit of romanticism in the far left about Mao Zedong and, and um, his um, writings. Can't say I ever shared that. In any event, the right wing 
saw the strategic merit of trying to enlist China against the Soviet Union uh, to bolster the containment of the Soviet Union, which eventually fulfilled its author, George Kennan's reasoning, which, uh, and, uh, which was that if the Soviet Union were walled off, it would eventually collapse of its own defects. Uh, so that was skeptically received, but received on the right. There were people who were diehard anti-communists or who had been involved with uh, Chiang Kai-shek or with McCarthy who uh, were opposed. Uh, but the dominant mood was favorable. 